Thank you very much. Uh, it is a privilege and an honor to address the fellows, uh, the family and the friends in the audience today because what I want to talk about crucially involves uh, public understanding and public debate um, of this question of the convergence of care and research. So as we look beyond Brexit to a fourth industrial revolution to give radical new ways to sustainably improve health and health care, driven and underpinned by actionable insights derived from ever more detailed digital traces of health at ever greater scale. Not only that, but in real time. You are here in the centre of this map. That is the River Thames running across the middle. And there's uh, 0400 on the right-hand side. So I hope none of you got up at that time in the morning. But if you did, these are some of the travel routes that you would have taken to get to this point on the planet. So our healthcare professionals and our patients do get up at four o'clock in the morning. And these are inpatient admissions uh, in red and in green discharges to one hospital, the hospital closest to this building, UCLH. And so these are live, real-time data from which we hope to draw and are drawing actionable insights. So about a million contacts per year in this particular NHS trust. So, like Uber, what we would like to do is derive information from the many to inform the services that are provided for an individual, to inform how their outcomes are realized and to be able to monitor those. So that's the Uber experience, and I can guess you can imagine that do we have that today in the National Health Service? No, we do not. So I want to present to you a somewhat dystopian future in nine years' time, aged 80, the NHS is dead. And I want to share with you an American obituary that focuses on one of the key reasons for that death. And it was because of the NHS's inability to understand its historic role in science. Self, how much was he aware of his own role yeah. in scientific history. He certainly didn't have a clear awareness of his own role. He would be told many times um, that, he, uh, that he was famous in, in a certain sense. As the studies on him went on, you know, certain things would stick. And so he may have, by the end of his life, had this you know, vague sense of, uh, of his importance, but he certainly didn't have any sort of clear sense like we do of how, how deeply and fundamentally important he was. So deeply and fundamentally important to science in the views of these commentators that the NHS uh, could and should be. So a Nobel Prize stemming importantly from the use of NHS data, some commentators would say that's a matter of, of time. And I want to give you some examples why. So let's start off with a woman, uh, a 45-year-old woman. Her blood pressure being taken here is 138 over 78. She's previously had radiotherapy for a left-sided breast tumour her mother died of a brain hemorrhage. So she may ask, well, what about other patients uh, like me? And the GP may say, you know what, no clinical guideline in the world addresses this patient, and absolutely no recommendation would be to run her blood pressure uh, lower. But the GP might think, you know what, I'm actually uncertain, maybe with that family history, with this history for this patient, we should be running her blood pressure lower. So the GP might ask, and the patient indeed may ask, how has the memory of the National Health Service contributed to understanding the management of this individual? If we could match to patients like me, there are three possible benefits. Firstly, this woman could identify whether there are randomized trials in which she may enroll. Um, secondly, the clinician may register their uncertainty and queue up the need for future uh, clinical trials. And thirdly, just possibly, those observational data, the memory in the system of the experience, the drug treatments, the admissions, the readmissions, and possibly death, of patients like this may inform the management of this patient. If you like, why does the clinician not order an informatics consult in clinical timescales in the same way that they may order an investigation like a magnetic resonance imaging? So when I say scale, how might we bring this to this individual patient? So let's take uh, the signal that one gets 
if one looks at the relationship between blood pressure on the left-hand side and the risk of one serious event, a brain hemorrhage, a particular kind of brain hemorrhage, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is uh, uncommon. So this is what one sees when one studies a sample of 500,000 individuals with NHS records. Noise. When one looks at 2 million patients with NHS records, one sees signal and a very strong relationship. And of course, with scale, one can also get at uh, resolution. So on the right-hand side here, this is the relationship between systolic blood pressure and another serious but uncommon cardiovascular disease, abdominal aortic aneurysm. Here there's a mechanistic insight because the top panel is uh, systolic blood pressure, no relationship, and the bottom panel is diastolic blood pressure for which there is a very strong uh, relationship. So these records on our patient, our woman, our 45-year-old woman, are diverse. They encapsulate uh, text, records, ECGs, drugs, imaging, blood tests, genomic information, mobile and wearables. These are data fundamentally in the wild. I might add to the beady eyed on, on the top there, that is, um, that's not just a bottle of ink, because of course handwriting uh, continues. It's a particular kind of ink. It's called registrar's ink. If you're very sharp, you can read that on the label. So the, this is the um, uh, data in the wild that is ever more accessible for researchers to generate a range of insights from. And in truth and in summary and in non-technical terms that are appropriate to this building, it looks like this. It's a bunch of blocks from which we seek to do replicable science and return value to clinical care. And we're making progress in combining those blocks in standardized ways that can be shared and used by other scientists uh, in an open online platform to define the fundamentals of disease uh, and health, something that some of you may think, haven't we already done that? Well, in the context of large-scale data, Absolutely no, we have not. So this is a, a Health Data Research UK uh, open and online uh, initiative. From birth, age zero, to age 80 plus, the frequency of the 300 most commonly occurring conditions that we uh, diagnose, so across mental health and respiratory and cardiovascular and cancer, across the life course, and there's an animation for that. Um, and what that does, what that allows one to do using these computable and reusable phenotypes is it allows that basic description, which picked up some attention from Eric Topol and, and the minister, but more importantly, even than these individuals, from a researcher who said thank you for making these available, it allows the research community to go on and answer, uh, pose and answer more interesting questions about the networks, uh, relationships between these diseases, uh, about systematically defining what it is we mean uh, by age-relating diseases, amongst other things. So our patient uh, is a participant in the 100,000 Genomes Project. She has her genome sequence uh, there in front of her, and she asks three questions. First, she says, Based on my genome, is my blood pressure any different? Well, a fifth of the people in this room have a genetically higher uh, blood pressure based on many variants in the genome. 10 millimeters of mercury, that's a big amount. That's a drug amount of a difference in blood pressure, higher than those with lower genetic risk. So she asks herself, hmm, what should I do? as well as the kind of research implications, should I be lowering the salt of my diet? Should I be changing the Fitbit settings and exercise more? The second thing that she notices is that same test has other actionable consequences. There are 28 uh, monogenic disorders for which a, an actionable variant would change clinical practice. And guess what? She has one. So, and, and when I say change practice, it's the gamut of medicine that would be different. So uh, for, on those images, uh, based on those uh, uncommon variants, uh, the patient could be recalled for imaging, for um, sigmoidoscopies, for drugs, uh, for devices, uh, and indeed for prophylactic surgery. I say uncommon, collectively they're common. So 3.5% 
of all people attending uh, a, a, house, uh, a hospital, certainly white Europeans, have one or more of these actionable variants. And the third thing, this sequence data at scale linked to long-term disease agnostic electronic health records this, is make this woman wittingly or unwittingly part of a medical revolution in how we develop new drugs. Because drugs that have evidence from the genome of uh, validity are more likely to uh, succeed, if you like, and are more likely to be efficient in development. And so society cares about that, not just getting uh, better drugs, but also in being able to afford them. So sadly, our woman does have a heart attack. And she, as I've said, is in the UK. And you might say, well, the UK here is not the place to be. So this is percentage dead at 30 days after a heart attack based on system-wide analysis. So this is every single hospital in two countries, in the UK and Sweden. There's no sort of opt-out clause. There's no other country with which we could compare here because the data don't exist. There's about a half a million heart attacks being analyzed here. And that ability in the UK to test the system and compare it with others is uh, important. So here, this is about a 10,000 deaths over a six-year period difference between the UK and Sweden. So I'm sorry to say she did indeed choose the wrong country if her heart attack had been before 2010. Since this analysis, that mortality gap has changed. But something which has not changed is how she chooses her hospital. So again, this is on the bottom, this is the number of UK hospitals showing that in hospitals, the mortality experience varies substantially between uh, hospitals. And that variation between hospitals is something, is a target uh, for data insights uh, to address. So I want to uh, talk about the people, uh, data and informatics and the insights from them, as, as is often said, it's all about the people. So my, uh, my three-dimensional science and society compass is from these Hemingways uh, and Claudia Langenberg, uh, my wife. Uh, the bottom three are, are, are with us today. Um, academic life is often uh, likened to a game of, of pinball. I think that's quite an appropriate analogy. The problem is it means that these are my plungers and flippers that have kept me, uh, kept me in play in my science career, for which I'm hugely uh, grateful. But right now, who is it? It's many, many people uh, who keep me uh, happy, and I hope to keep happy in return. So part of my job is, in my institute, to have spontaneous outbursts of joy. So I would love to say that this uh, particular uh, postdoctoral researcher had just uh, independently validated an AI algorithm for the early detection of eight solid cancers. The truth is, she's just submitted her 10th application for approval for researcher access for NHS data which is a problem, and I would also say it was rejected. So HDR UK, uh, this is a partnership of uh, these five universities uh, in London, and some of our critical friends say, well, that's a first since the time of Churchill, uh, but we are delivering, and here's an example of how we expect to deliver. Each dot on this figure is a scientist, and every line between the dots is uh, a join on a... a Publication. So this is a co-author publication research network. On the left uh, is that network in the first 30-month period. On the right is that network in the second 30-month period of the Forerunner Institute to Health Data Research UK. So we want to have some fireworks, and I'm going to end with our vision in Health Data Research UK, which is to bring together large-scale data and advanced analytics to healthcare endeavours and to research. And my last slide to end on a somber note is to recognize Jackie Pallas, uh, a role model uh, in tech in the university sector. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>